Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast, our first episode of February 2024. Uh, remarkable January is already by the wayside, uh, and we march forward in, into yet another familiar kind of setting here in Happy Valley, a Saturday with a Junior Day event. That's how we finished out in January. The last couple Saturdays here had a bunch to talk about. We're going to break down this final one of three consecutive weekends like this with Tyler Calvaruso, a bunch of names to know within the region, beyond the region, and a really compelling in-state quarterback target is going to be back on campus as well. We'll go through some of this stuff with Tyler, along with what he's looking at in terms of the 2026 class, which is also going to bring a major talent from the state of Pennsylvania to campus this weekend as well. And, and we'll keep Tyler on board for a little extra on this episode because we're going to do a red shirt freshman refresh. They are not the new guys around campus anymore. Many of them have now been here for a full calendar year because you had the January 2023 enrollees in town and they are the second year Nittany Lions who didn't play five or more games last season. So they didn't burn that red shirt. And yet some of them got out there and got some significant experience. Others didn't play a single snap on Saturdays. And we're going to work our way through that group with Tyler Calvaruso because he covered them so closely as high school seniors and, and during their recruitment processes coming to campus. So we're going to kind of mesh his thoughts on some of these things with what we've already discussed here regarding depth chart, what the roster looks like, and how that could dictate who is actually involved on the field next fall from that 2023 Penn State class. By the way, five guys burned red shirt last fall. We'll get into all that a little bit later down the road, but as I said, Third straight junior day. Let's dive into that conversation and Tyler Calvaruso climb aboard once again. We appreciate it. It feels like you have been on just about every episode of this podcast the last few weeks because uh, for good reason. Uh, all of a sudden, after after you go a little while without a lot of recruiting news, you know, the signing day pops up in late December, but so much focus on postseason preparation, on the coaching carousel, the transfer portal, and then we get to mid-January and everyone's like, oh yeah, there's all this recruiting going on. The coaches are flying around the country. On Saturdays, we got uh, recruits coming to see the coaches here on campus, and that's what we're focused in on once again, Tyler. Just how busy has this period been for Penn State in terms of moving pieces? is and guys not just hosting talent but going out and seeing talent all over different regions yeah it's definitely busy again on the high school recruiting front i can tell you that you know leading up to the early signing period in december we didn't really have a whole lot to talk about on that high school recruiting front just given the fact that penn state's 2024 class was so locked in so really other than portal talk i didn't really have a whole lot and now you guys can't get rid of me i'm back here talking ball Every podcast, it seems like now, because that, that's for good reason, man. I mean, every weekend, Penn State is getting an impressive group of visitors to campus, and that comes after an entire week spent out on the road recruiting. You're seeing head coach James Franklin and his staff all over the nation making stops, checking in with guys who are in the 2025 class high on the board. You know, it's just it's a never ending thing for this staff. Recruiting never stops unless there's a dead period, and then, you know, a little bit of a break, but those don't last too long. And uh, this, this weekend coming up, Last chance for Penn State to get a group of visitors on campus before the dead period that starts on February 5th. It's a pretty solid group of visitors right now, I'd say. Maybe not as large in numbers as some of the other – the first two weekends, but definitely there in quality. So we've got a bunch of really high-end recruits to talk about here. Yeah, and let's, let's start with, with uh, a local flavor because we're going to get into prospects out of Florida, Maryland, Virginia. That, that yeah. We always get into the, that kind of conversation, but we don't often talk about an in-state quarterback with a Penn State offer visiting campus. I think I've noted this a few times since he arrived on campus, but Bo Prabula is the only in-state scholarship quarterback to, to show up to campus as a freshman in about a 13-year span at this point at Penn State. I mean, that is a lengthy amount of time. Uh, so Penn State's been selective about who they offer in the state. It's not like they're targeting a Pennsylvania high school quarterback and keep missing out on him. They're very selective on these offers. And, and Matt Zoller's got one, and he was one of our favorites, Tyler. I think Daniel Gallon was probably higher on him than anybody last summer when he was in town for seven-on-seven -seven action, and he was slinging the football around. And you knew then he was a guy to watch. I don't know if any of us quite – fully believed or, or, or knew that the Nitty Lions were going to jump in head first, but they have done that since then. Uh, and they have entered their, their, you know, entered this recruitment and, and all of a sudden he's a top 10 quarterback 
in the 24-7 sports rankings. He's a top 150 overall prospect out of Spring Ford High School here in the state of Pennsylvania. Over 6'3", over 200 pounds, a lot to like it. Uh, well over a dozen offers at this point. Uh, Florida Gators were, you know, brought a new SEC element to this not too long ago. He went south to see a little bit of the recruiting world not too long ago. And now he circles back where, you know, a lot of this buzz began last summer here at Penn State. Yeah, when we first saw Matt Zoller during the summer, I wasn't quite sure what exactly he was going to be. I mean, you could see the talent. You know, you could see the arm talent. You could see his ability to fit the ball in tight windows and really drive it downfield in a seven-on-seven setting. The Old Dominion staff clearly saw something when he was participating in that seven-on-seven, dishing out an offer. But, you know, when it comes to in-state recruiting, we always talk about it where Penn State is selective with the guys it goes after. So it was kind of, you know, at that point still TBD on whether Penn State would enter the race for Zollers, but the staff kept a really close eye on him throughout his junior season at Springford, as did numerous other Power 5 programs. And that film, you know, we always talk about film checking out, but Zoller's film more than checked out, man. He was a stud throughout his junior season. That led to Penn State eventually jumping in. And, you know, the Nittany Lions are a big player in his process. The one thing worth noting with Zoller's recently is just given the, you know, kind of mini blow up that he's had with all these new offers coming in. Georgia offered. He made it down to Athens for a visit. I've been asking around since that visit took place. I think the Bulldogs in that visit went really well between those two parties. The big thing there is the status of Georgia with Julian Lewis, the former USC commit. You know, if he were to pledge to Georgia, how does that change things for Georgia's 2025 quarterback outlook? You know, that another thing that remains to be seen. But when it comes to Penn State and Zollers, Nittany Lions are in a pretty good spot here, I would say, even with Georgia's involvement and the involvement of other top-tier programs. Fact of the matter is, Zollers has been to Penn State more than anywhere in his recruitment. He's going to be back again on Saturday. He's been around Andy Kotelnicki since he was appointed as Penn State's offensive coordinator. That relationship has come along nicely, and it seems like Zollers likes the fit in Kotelnicki's scheme and what he could accomplish in that scheme. He told me initially right off the bat before he even met Kotelnicki that he was intrigued by the hire and what it could mean you know, for his recruitment. Moving forward, it seems like those two have a good relationship to start. Danny O'Brien, the grads assistant, who's essentially the de facto quarterbacks coach, those two have been tight for an extended period of time, dating all the way back to the beginning of Zoller's recruitment. He was just camping and participating in seven-on-sevens at Penn State. So I think the Nittany Lions have a lot going for them. With Zollers. I'm interested to see what comes to this weekend in the sense that, you know, I mentioned that Georgia visit. Where does he want to go from here after this Penn State visit in terms of decision timeline? Because at one point I heard, you know, maybe even this month tossed around as a potential decision for Zollers. But does Georgia slow things down for him? Does that lead to this process playing out until the spring? I'm not entirely sure right now. I think we'll have some more clarity on that coming out of the weekend. But regardless, I think Penn State has positions his own quite well with the in-state standout. I really like what the Nittany Lions have done here. And Kotal Nicky probably deserves some credit for picking this relationship up up on the fly and, you know, really getting it to that next level and making Zoller feel comfortable. I think we were all curious what, what his junior season was going to look like after what he showed us on the seven on seven platform. And what he went out and did was uh, 3000 passing yards, just shy of that at 2,917 of them, 37 touchdown throws, just two interceptions on the season. He added seven touchdowns as a runner so 44 total tds to just two interceptions as a junior the kind of dominance you want to see at that level and and, and let's address another issue at quarterback it's not really an issue it's just the part of the storyline with this class is you've got beckham Kritza committed as well at a fairview high school in boulder colorado he is the number 40 quarterback about 24-7 sports assessment the number one player from that state he's a fine prospect obviously but in 24-7 sports assessment He's 31 slots down at that position compared to the in-state prospect. Kritz has talked about trying to become a leader in this class, and I don't think anything's going to slow him down. But from what you've gathered, how does he feel about the prospect of a second quarterback being added to the mix? And how does Zollers feel about you know joining a class that already has someone involved at his position? Hasn't been a deterrent for either of them, and pretty much for the same reason. You know, both of these guys embrace competition. You look at Kurtz's high school career, you know, he's bounced about a bunch. He's been around a lot of quality quarterbacks, and he has had to compete everywhere he has been. And it's something that he's looking forward to if it is a two quarterback class. You know, through my conversations with him, he's just really excited about the direction of Penn State's offense under Cold Nick. If he has to compete with someone, so be it. And, you know, you get the sense from Zollers as well. If he has to compete with someone and beat him out, so be it. These guys are both highly competitive quarterbacks. And you saw that with Kritzma, who, you know, he did well for himself down at a uh, battle seven on seven. 
in Florida last weekend. So he's been – Andrew Ivins even wrote this in you know his review of that whole tournament, which I definitely encourage everybody to check out. There's a lot of in-depth recruiting intel and notes on prospects in that 2025 class. Crits have garnered a mention, and you know his high school journey has made him kind of a tough evaluation because there's not a ton of film. But what's out there is quality, and you know he showed – his arm talent at that seven on seven. So Kritza, you know, he can't become the forgotten guy in this class. We talk a lot about Zollers, Malik Washington, Tamar Bishop Spaulding is another guy that we've talked about a bunch of potential addition at quarterback, but Kritz is there and I don't anticipate him going anywhere. You know, the staff likes him. Kritza likes the staff. It just seems like everything is lined there. And then for Zollers, same thing. If he wants to come to Penn state, he's going to be ready to battle with whoever's in the quarterback room, whether it be Kritz or who's the guys who are already on campus. And what I do wonder with Zollers as well is we are also in the portion uh, of the year where, you know, you, you, the coaches can't go up to see everybody this this window. You can't go and see every campus. And there's with the quarterbacks, it's like, let us th see you throw in person. And I just wonder how many carrots at the end of the stick are being dangled in front of them right now from some you know power five heavyweights that are saying, can you get down here? Come springtime, throw the ball around on our campus a little bit, and and we think we'll be comfortable enough to add you to our target board and move forward with an offer. That's kind of the reality sometimes for quarterbacks. And, and so you just wonder who may else be kind of circling around here. It's not always about the offers on the table. It's kind of what's happening on the peripheral at the quarterback position. We know how much of a dominoes game it can be in the 2025 class, and that can get rolling in a hurry the spring of these guys' junior years before they go to their senior season. So really something to watch here for, for someone in Zollers who's now a top 10 quarterback prospect nationally on 24 seven sports uh, in state has been great to Penn state for running back position. You know, unlike the, the quarterback spot, it feels like they're able to go to that well on an almost annual basis and, and, and find a really talented running back. But when they have looked elsewhere, Virginia has been a popular destination. You think about Devin Ford, Ricky Slade, uh, high caliber running back recruits that came from that state. And another one popped up on the target board pretty recently in January as Jeff Overton from Freedom High School in Woodbridge, Virginia, picked up a Penn State scholarship offer. Didn't take long to reciprocate interest here. Tyler Calvaruso, he'll be making his trip to campus, getting a little bit more familiar with Jaywan Sider and company. Yeah, Penn State has done well in Virginia with running backs. You know, even Katron Allen, a Virginia native. I know he prepped at IMG, right. but, you know, he was another guy from that state that really liked Penn State and wound up deciding to play for the New Lions. You know, Penn State gets an interesting spot when it comes to running back recruiting in 2025 because there already has a pair of guys on board that it really, really likes in Keandre Barker from Texas and, you know, Alec Clip is Tyke Hayes. You know, Penn State staff likes those guys a lot. But, you know, the door has remained open for a third running back addition. Yeah, you know, I think the staff is in position, definitely in a position to be selective at running back and moving forward with, you know, if it decides to add a third guy into the mix, you can really pick and choose who you want. Overton's a more recent offer at the position. You know, he's versatile. He could do a lot of different things for an offense, which I think is kind of going to be a theme in Andy Kotelnicki's offense moving forward. You're going to see guys with versatile skill sets. Overton is definitely one of them. He's going to be making it to campus, really just looking to learn more about Sire and the Penn State staff as a whole. You know, I mentioned that versatility of his skill set, but what would that mean for him in Penn State's offense? He's going to gain some insight into that. He's a solid prospect, I think. You know, I, I put on his tape after Penn State offered him. You, you see that he could probably play at this level. You know, he the offer sheet reflects that as well, I would say. So I think we'll know more about Overton and his interest in Penn State coming out of the weekend and Penn State's interest in Overton as well. Because, again, that relationship is still new and it's still growing. Yeah, and, and Ohio State is another team that, that recently entered this recruitment. Yep. So it's it's getting really interesting in a hurry for Overton's recruitment. He had told 24-7 Sports uh, just last week that he hopes to get out after the dead period that you just mentioned to see Ohio State, to see a school like yeah. Oregon, to see Nebraska. So, uh, you know, it, we'll see if Penn State has some staying power. But as you mentioned – it's already, you know, it, it got crowded in a hurry at running back in the 2025 class. And, and it is always a bit of a sprint right now to claim your spot as a running back at Penn State. We don't see a lot of guys hesitating on that opportunity anymore in the recruiting trail. Um, over at receiver, there was just so much to look at here that I didn't want to go specific name on you. Six <laughs> players from the 2025 class at the receiver position who carry Penn State scholarship offers are expected to be on campus for this Junior Day event Saturday. So we've talked a lot about Marcus Higgins trying to shuffle and, and really in, in some ways sharpen up that target board for the 2025 wide receiver spot as they move towards spring and, and they try to game plan for what this class is going to look like and who they're going to prioritize and where the visits are going to go and all that stuff. This weekend, I'd imagine, is going to help with that process. 
Yeah, it's definitely go. It's, I mean, it's a big weekend coming up for Marcus Hagan with some of the guys he's getting on canvas. You know, Penn State has offered almost 80 wide receivers in this 2025 class. And, you know, there's definitely a chance more go out. So this, you know, we were talking about clarity coming out of these junior day visits. I think Penn State's going to get a little bit of that with its wide receiver board. You get these guys on campus. You don't just get to build a relationship with them. You know, you verify their measurables and you get eyes on them. And that's always an important part of the evaluation process and determining where your board really sits coming out of these junior day visits. The top guy this weekend to me is Jeff Exner from McDonough School. You know, the relationship there between the Penn State staff and McDonough is well documented. Exner, he's one of the more interesting prospects in this cycle overall to me, not even just from a Penn State perspective. Really overall, if you look at the, you know, kind of arc of his recruitment early on, he was looked at as an edge guy. But then, you know, as his process has played out, more wide receiver and just his athleticism, what shines through. You know, he's a really athletic kid for his size and Penn State likes that about him. Yeah, there are a bunch of other Power 5 programs pushing pretty hard to get eggs near Penn State right up there at the top of the list. It's going to be his first time on campus in a little bit. So, you know, him getting back to town, getting back with Hagens. Again, we talk about comfort with Kodal Nicky and, you know, learning more about roles in the offense. I think that's going to be kind of a priority for all of the wide receivers who visit this weekend. Exner, for me, he's the top guy making it to campus this weekend among a talented group. So I think that's saying something. You know, the Baltimore City College duo of Vernon Allen and Romero Ison is intriguing. Allen's been on the board for a little bit longer than Ison. He kind of, Ison picked up his offer a little bit later in the process. But his recruitment has started to take off. Again, Baltimore City College is another school where Penn State has done well in the past in terms of forming relationships. So you got to keep an eye on those two this weekend. You know, in New England, you've got Jordan Houston, the New York native. You know, he started his high school career at Christ the King with Ty Blanding. So those two were teammates for a short period of time. I remember Houston making it to campus to camp as an underclassman. It really caught the attention of the staff that day. That was dating all the way back to Taylor Stubblefield's tenure. He picked up an offer. You know, the contact has remained in place since he made the move over to St. Thomas More in Connecticut. When he participated in the whiteout camp, at the end of June, he was a guy who received a lot of individual attention from Marcus Hagens during drill work. So anytime you see that in a camp setting, it opened some eyes. Houston held his own in one-on-ones. So he's another one of those guys you got to keep an eye on this weekend. And then moving down to Florida. Actually, no, let's not move down to Florida first. We got to stay in the DMV. Trey Jones, man, from Oscar I told, I t- Hold on, folks. I told you there's a lot of wide receivers. My yeah. man is, like, shifting through this conversation <laughs> geographically in his mind. That's how many receivers are coming to campus. <laughs> That's what we got to do, man. But, man, Trey Jones from Oscar Smith High in Chesapeake, Virginia, when you talk about fast, he's fast. His track times are legit. You know, it's the kind of track times that make you wonder if when Penn State gets him back on campus and, you know, gets eyes on him again, do you, is that a guy, you know, you say no to as his process continues to play out because his speed is legit. Penn State issued an offer to Jones in the fall. This is a visit that he is really, really excited about. Nittany Lions are pretty high on his list ahead of this visit. He wants to get to know more about Higgins and really just Penn State as a whole. You know, we talk about the difference between game visits and a visit like this, which a junior day visit is more in-depth. So Jones is excited about that. Now we're going down to Florida. This is a guy I really like personally, and that's Samari Reed. From Monarch High in Pompano Beach. You know, Monarch made it to Penn State to participate in the seven on seven tournament. And it's pretty easy to say that that program is absolutely loaded with talent and wide just, receiver. They stood out just a little bit, didn't they? They stood out just a little bit that day. Yeah, just a little bit. I mean, Jabari Brady in the 2026 class, I know he's not visiting but this weekend, but man, that kid could play. And then opposite him is Samari Reed in the 2025 class. So he has a bunch of power five offers, Penn State being one of them. You know, he impressed. During that seven on seven, but offered didn't come until a little bit later as the evaluation process continued to play out. His relationship with running backs Jaywan Sider is in a really good place. He's talked to multiple other members of the staff as well, Higgins included, but he's really gotten to know Sider. Sider checked on him at school recently. They had a good talk. So another guy who's really excited to make it to Penn State and get more of a feeling for what the program has to offer. Not a lot of guys in college football who can open more doors for you in that area of the of the recruiting world as Jay Wan Sider can and, and has continued to do for Penn State for the last half decade plus now. Um, and it go, certainly goes beyond his position room as well as, as we've learned over the years. Um, going over to the offensive line and gr- great job with that wide receiver group. And I just want to note, you mentioned some familiar schools there. St. Thomas Moore, that's a, that program has been very good to Penn State in recent mm-hmm. years and, and, and getting players here to campus. And then, of course, the McDonough School. We know what that has meant out of Maryland. It's produced three or four starters on this defensive unit in the last three or four years alone. 
Um, on the offensive line, though, before we get to another in-state prospect who's who's making his way to campus and is really compelling to you and I both, uh, Michael Gibbs, I think, is a good example of the stepping stone business that college football recruiting can be. He gets an offer the first week of January from Penn State. Uh, a couple weeks later, Phil Troutwine follows up with a visit to his school in Wilmington, North Carolina. And a couple weeks after that, he's following it up with a trip up to State College to see Phil Troutwine, the rest of the staff, and Penn State facilities. Again, this happened in a one-month span where you get an offer, you get a visit from the coach, now you're visiting campus. This is a kind of how you draw it up if you're the Nittany Lions and, and, and trying to form a relationship and form a recruitment process. So what's the investment look like with Michael Gibbs at this point? You know, that timeline, whenever it plays out that way, it always speaks to the interest level of the recruit, you know, because they get so many visits from coaches throughout this period. And when you get a coach on campus, then you lock in a visit with him shortly after. It kind of speaks to where the real interest is at this point in prospects recruitment. I'd say that applies to Gibbs. He's really getting – he's really liking Phil Troutland since he's gotten to know him. And I think that relationship's in a pretty good place ahead of this visit. And he's going to learn more about Penn State's offensive line room, more about Troutwain's philosophy. seems like the family really likes Troutwain and just his overall background, you know, developing offensive linemen and getting those guys to the next level. So, I mean, he is one of many intriguing visitors on the offensive line this weekend. You know, him being down in the Carolinas, you know, that's another area Penn State has done well. I mean, they did well with Ethan Calloway, who didn't wind up with the Nittany Lions, but in the Carolinas' last cycle, you know, got him to campus for an official visit. And Penn State made itself a real player there when, you know, the odds were stacked against it. So I think with Gibbs, he's an a, he's definitely an intriguing name on the board as that offensive line group continues to come together. Another one is Zaire Addison, you know, from Florida. He's a four-star tackle who's going to be making the trip. Troutwain dropped in on him earlier this week, multiple other members of the staff as well. So it's a good offensive line group this weekend. Gibbs, by the way, I think it has an offer from just about everybody on the James Franklin coaching tree. Old Dominion and Ricky yep. Ronnie <laughs> offered during his junior season. And then in the month of January, when Penn State offered, you had old friend Manny Diaz and the Duke Blue Devils under his recruitment. And just last week, uh, Brent Pry and Virginia Tech extend a scholarship offer to the North Carolina standout. So uh, a lot uh, a lot expanding in his recruitment, especially there within the Mid-Atlantic. But he's taking the time before this dead period to take a longer look at Happy Valley and see what Phil Troutwine has to offer. Staying on the offensive line, going back to the 2026 class, we, as we've mentioned, there's a lot of important visitors in these last three weeks who are high school sophomores going on high school juniors may sound like they're only halfway through high school. What's the big deal? Well, things move fast in the college football world. And a lot of these guys are up to a dozen, maybe 20 offers at this point, if they're legit. Uh, one of them is Kevin Brown out of Harrisburg high school. He was an all state performer as a freshman starter for Harrisburg during their March to a state championship in 2022. We got eyes on him last summer, a couple different times at Penn state, we absolutely loved him. We named him one of our premier performers at the camps. Uh, we certainly know that Phil Troutwine is a big fan of what Kevin Brown can do. He's the son of a former offensive lineman, West Virginia. He's got a lot of power five interest brewing. He's a guy who's played his recruitment process pretty close to the vest thus far. We've had a couple conversations with him, but him getting back here and just getting face to face and, and building that familiarity. I'm telling you, you don't see a lot of tackle prospects like this guy. He's, he's may not be 260 pounds yet, but you talk about projectables, he's got all those things that, that you can project out and that you absolutely fall in love with on the perimeter of the offensive line. He might not be 260 yet, but the fact that he is as muscle-bound as he is at 240, I mean, this is a lean 6'5", 240. You know, I mean, he is just – he's one of the more impressive, probably, offensive tackle athletes I've seen in a really long time. I know I'm not that old. I haven't seen that many guys. But Kevin Brown, he's really one of those ones who stands out, man. His body composition at such a young age, it's kind of like a strength and conditioning coach's dream. You know, like he's just – there's so and, much and potential what, there. What stood out to me was the lack of sloppiness physically yeah. at that age. Because you talk offensive linemen, you talk sophomore year, usually it's not good weight. He, he, he needs to add, you know, he could use a little bit of flub. Let's put it that way. And, and it, But he's got that muscle, like you said. And then the lack of sloppiness fundamentally. You know, they matched him against some some older, more experienced and, and high-level prospects who were in attendance at these camps and at these events. And, and we saw him really just stay consistent, stay tight with his work. And I think that's really impressive, too. This is all while he knows that the likes of Tr Phil Troutwine – James Franklin, you know, player personnel director for Penn State, are, 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 are watching his every move. I came away really impressed with that poise and just the lack of sloppiness physically, fundamentally. Yeah, I, I think it was impossible not to be impressed. When you look at Brown and like where he is as an underclassman, 
And it's kind of like the anti Javen Williams. I remember going back to the early stages of Javen Williams recruitment, you know, back when I was covering Boston college and they were involved with him. He still had a lot to work on physically because there was a lot of weight there, but you know, it was just still some baby fat where he was kind of, you know, growing into his frame and adding muscle. And then by the time he popped on a Penn state's radar and just as his recruitment went on and his time as a Nittany Lions commit, you saw the physical transformation. And really, I mean, the freak that he turned into because he is so well put together physically. Now, by the time he reaches senior year of high school, he reached that point. Point. So like it's like those two are opposite. Brown's already ahead of the curve in that regard. I think you know, I mean, Penn State has a real opportunity in this 2026 class to clean up in its own backyard with offensive line recruiting. You got Kevin Brown. You got Tyler Merrill, who made it to a junior day earlier this – or not even this month anymore, earlier in January, and he has an any line high on his list. You know, if Penn State could seal the deal with both of those guys, that would be huge. I mean, I know it's still early in that 2026 cycle – Messiah Mickens, he's an early part of the class, but I think Penn State has a real in-state opportunity with those guys. It's going to be interesting to see the feedback we get from Brown this weekend. You know, just given he hasn't done a whole lot in the early stages of his recruitment. You know, Wisconsin offered recently. That was a big offer. But, you know, he hasn't been to a ton of schools yet, but he's been to Penn State multiple times now, so that's always noteworthy. He's a guy that, that I, I've had a you know, conversation or two with him and just speaking with his father, very focused on the task at hand. I, I don't think maybe it changes as he gets a little older. I just doesn't seem to be someone who's going to be buying into recruiting hype and, and really expressing it on social media in any way. Um, right now, I know he's pretty focused on wrestling season, uh, but but really curious to, to see what comes of this one. And, and he is a top 100 prospect. At, at overall in, in 24-7 sports, very early assessment of the 2026 class. He's the number three player in Pennsylvania, number 13 overall offensive tackle, and number 91 player in that class. Uh, and Ty Merrill, that you mentioned, also a top 100 prospect right now. He's already over 300 pounds. These guys are probably separated by 60 pounds, 70 pounds at, at the, at, in the same class at the high school level, and both of them are really prized prospects on Penn State's offensive tackle board and, and just kind of goes to show you the evolution of, of each of these athletes as they make their way uh, to being college uh, college forces. Tyler, where do we want to go next? I was thinking before we get to the commit that, that to address, we'd go with a defender because we've gone all offensive heavy and, and one that has a Penn State offer and will be on campus is a cornerback and Deshaun Stewart. Um, why did you want to specifically go with with him? Because there was others we could have gone in the direction of. Is it because he's from DePaul Catholic? He's a Jersey guy, or or is there greater value to this one? And I know I say he's a cornerback. I should really label him a defensive back, and yeah. maybe you have an answer on where he lies in the backfield. Yeah, I was interested because I got the chance to see him play during the fall. I, I was kind of wondering where he would wind up on the back end of a secondary at the next level because I could see cornerback, I could see safety as well. But I know Penn State likes him at cornerback. I think a couple other schools do as well. But I could understand that given what I saw from him out of coverage. You know, I mean, you know, between the fact that I got to see him in person, just the fact that his stock has been on the rise recently, you know, he's up to a four star in that composite. I believe we have him as a high three star here at 88 rating. So it's clearly nine. He's, he's, he's right. He's knocking on that four star door. Yeah, he's almost sure. there. He had a really good junior season. I think, uh, I think he's definitely a guy who has shown that he could play at this level you know he's definitely up there on that cornerback board he hasn't been to campus for a while he visited you know multiple times during the season he tried to make it back again late in the season so his interest in penn state is pretty clear you know cornerbacks coach terry smith he's got a lot of talented guys to pick from at that position so that's another board that's still coming together and a guy like stewart you know how this visit plays out we'll see where things are afterward penn state quite frankly does stand out on his offer sheet as things stand right now tyler and maybe that 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 changes a little bit as the the camp season starts to come around and he gets more looks out there but penn state does stand out on this offer sheet and 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 so does six foot two 185 pounds uh yeah. as a as a cornerback recruit who's only a high school junior so he'll come to campus there, there's a lot to like about what penn state can sell at the cornerback spot right now we saw them be very effective with selling it in the transfer portal and getting Jalen Kimber and adding AJ Harris, a couple of former blue chip recruits in their own right. Um, over in the committed category, one guy I wanted to focus on, and we're going to stay in the Garden State, and I know you love that, but DJ McClary, uh, New Jersey linebacker, somebody who's been committed to this program for a while, but as we know, a bit of a shakeup on the defensive staff with coordinator and linebackers coach Manny Diaz taking the Duke head coaching job, and Former Indiana Hoosiers head coach Tom Allen taking the defensive coordinator and linebacker position at Penn State. So those two will get 
a, a little bit of a better opportunity to know each other. And McClary, no slouch at all in terms of 24-7 sports rankings. Number 135 overall. He's a top 20 linebacker, the number two player in New Jersey, committed to late September of 2023. Yeah, and, you know, the change of defensive coordinator I don't think has impacted McClary in much of a negative way or anything like that. You know, he was going to be on campus last week and just wasn't able to make it up. But the plan is for him to be on campus this weekend. And I think the most important thing is, you know, a month that is busy with visits. You know, McClary hasn't been popping up elsewhere at other college campuses. He hasn't really been, you know, doing much else on the visit front. So that's always encouraging. I don't think Penn State fans really have anything to worry about here. With McClary, you know, another guy who his commitment to Penn State went beyond just one coach. He really liked Manny Diaz, no doubt about it. I remember the first time I interviewed McClary after he got his offer, the message was pretty clear from Diaz, and it was, we're going to recruit the hell out of you. And that was what he got from Manny Diaz and Gabe Infante. Neither are at Penn State anymore, so the circumstances are a little bit different now. But Again, uh, he, he likes the staff beyond those two, and he likes his fit. He'll learn more about Tom Allen's plans for him this weekend. I think things are going to wind up in a good spot there, and I think the Indy Lions are in a good spot to you know lock this one down, hang on to their top 27 backer from uh, Jersey. Yeah, McClary is currently their top overall prospect in terms of 2020, uh, 2025 rankings at 24-7 sports, as I said, number 135 overall. This is a class that has eight commits, ranked seventh nationally, uh, and after a third junior day goes in the books on Saturday, I think we'll all start to wait and see do some of those commitments come to fruition now that we're in a dead period. Guys have some time to gather their thoughts. Maybe they visited a few other schools. That's kind of the last point I wanted to make, and I wanted to hear from you on the subject of the Junior Day series uh, here in the last three weeks. Is is that your anticipation that when this dead period arrives and, and we settle in for some time in February where guys can't go to campuses and coaches can't go to them, that maybe some decisions pop up and maybe this class gets bigger? Yes and no, because you look at guys like Zollers and Alex Tesh who have been around a while. You know, they visited multiple times, and they could be on the verge of – either wrapping things up or getting closer to wrapping things up. Then you look at in-state standouts like Mike Carroll, who is high on Penn State's board. And, you know, you look at a pretty clear desire to kind of extend that recruiting process and take more visits. Josh Williams is another guy who I'd say falls into that category. So it, it really, it's a case by case thing. I would say, I think it depends on where the prospect wants to go at this point in his recruitment. I think generally speaking, you're probably going to see more guys extend on to the spring. And it's for all the reasons we've touched on, you know, the unlimited official visits and just the desire to take the recruitment as far as it can be and making it as detailed as a decision as a recruit can make. Now, I think, you know, could a guy like Zollers pop early? It's definitely possible. Could I like taste top pop early? It's definitely possible. But, uh, you know, I think the days of the bigger numbers – in a recruiting class coming during the winter are probably over. I, I think we kind of saw it last cycle as well in that 2024 class. The bulk of that class was built during June official visit season. There were definitely some winter commitments. You know, Anthony Specka, Kenny Wolsey popped, you know, Kari Jackson popped. But the bulk of that class was built in the summer during official visits. And that's probably what I anticipate from this 2025 group and, you know, beyond as well, 2026, 2027, moving forward. I think that's just going to be the common trend. I think maybe you see a few guys go off the board, but more probably a little bit later on. Yeah, it's interesting because you're getting guys making decisions later and you're getting a lot of guys getting to campus earlier. So just yeah. overall, the, you know, the, the from from the commitment to the enrollment, that, that window is getting a lot tighter across college football yeah. as you kind of tee it up. And it makes sense uh, with, with that spring official visit window uh, surfacing a few years back why you would see guys be more motivated to wait to make decisions. And uh, again, I always say if, if you're someone who's on the bubble and feels like you might be on the fringe of exploding, maybe give it a couple camps because that's all it takes sometimes to see a guy go from 12 offers and many of them being regional to all of a sudden he's got 25 offers and the biggest names in power five want him to do official visits on their campus. So uh, we'll see what happens, man. It'll be an interesting month ahead. You'll have full coverage from this third junior day. Um, I, I know Brian Doan and, and the usual suspects will chime in as well as they have conversations, but a lot coming your way at lines 247com beginning on Saturday, late afternoon, evening, and then continuing through the weekend into early next week uh, from reactions to whatever breaks potentially during the course of this weekend. And then Tyler, you and I are now going to step over to the current roster and kind of put uh, look toward the rearview mirror, I guess, on the recruiting trail 
because this was the class that you first covered when you joined yeah. our Penn State beat, the 2023 group that got to campus, many of them in January of 2023, and then eventually the whole group was on board by last June wasn't the major impact that we felt in a, you know, in a, in a, you know, there's not a lot of classes that had the major impact that we felt in 2022 when they burned 10 red shirts and a bunch of those guys ended up starting by the end of the season and having a huge role on an 11 win team this past year, five guys burned red shirt and really none of them sunk their teeth into a, a consistent role on, on either side of the football it was all five of them burned red shirt on defense, uh, Tony Rojas at linebacker, Jamil Lyons at defensive end, and then three in the defensive backfield, King Mack at safety, Zion Tracy and Elliott Washington at the cornerback spots. Much of their work came on special teams. No one had, I think, more than 150 game snaps out of that group. So, Tyler, we are still have a lot to learn about that class as a whole, but you and I are going to focus on those who actually did take red shirts and I think it's an appropriate place to start because uh, this is a guy that that you know th this is a group that burned or didn't burn any and preserved four red shirts is the offensive line. And I, I think the name we got to begin with is Anthony Donka because of the way he finished things out in the Peach Bowl. Yeah, it's kind of remarkable that given the way things ended for Donka in the 2023 season with him coming on so late and so many people speaking so highly of him that he wound up hanging on to his red shirt. But I mean, going back to his recruitment. He was always one of those guys who wasn't really talked about a whole lot, given some of the star power in that 2023 recruiting class on the offensive line. And he's, you know, Penn State always felt really confident in his ability and his versatility and just what he would bring to the table at multiple spots. And I think we saw some of that from him as his freshman year went on. You know, I do think that Donk is going to be a huge factor on Penn State's offensive line as his career progresses. I mean, the talent is clearly there. That's a guy who is going to show up every single day and work his butt off, and he's going to fight for a position. You know, he was never going to bow out. And he's never going to take a playoff. So, of all these guys who hung on to their red shirt, I mean, Anthony Donko, he really, really stands out. And his, his ceiling is pretty high. Do I think he has star potential? I mean, I don't think it's a stretch to say that. When you have so many people speaking so highly of a guy as an underclassman, it speaks volumes because, you know, not, that kind of praise, it really does not get tossed around lightly. You know, because you don't want to set unrealistic expectations for a guy. But Donka, every expectation that's been set for him, he's met it immensely. Yeah, and we know that it's not just relying on raw skill. This is a guy who, exactly. as every step of the way, everyone's been you know tooting his horn about dedicated worker. This goes back to, to his recruitment process and a guy who kept showing back up to camps, came to every single camp he could under Phil Troutwine. That's not an easy drive for him or mom or dad to keep making from Virginia, but he did. And I think that we heard about that paying off through his first semester last year. And then obviously we heard from Caden Wallace not too long ago here on the podcast when he joined us in January, just about the kind of work he put in. It was a collective effort, kind of the, the village stepped up in December to help him be prepared for that role at right tackle, but he took ownership of that in a big way. He did not play tackle at the high school level. He did not play tackle during the regular season. He did not play tackle during the spring ball. And that goes for games. That goes for practices in high school. He was a, uh, a guard all the way, an interior presence. And that's where we saw him involved at left guard quite a bit early on in preseason camp and wondered if he might need to burn a red shirt because Lennon Tengwall's retirement and with some injuries else that, that factored in there. So to see him all of a sudden be kind of the guy at right tackle in terms of that competition, I'm not saying he's the guy to start right away, but I know people are saying, well, Nolan Rucci, shouldn't that be more of the, you know, if you're going to put one or the other on the depth chart right now, shouldn't Rucci be higher? He's a fourth year player. He's a former five-star this is where I have to remind people, upon further review, Nolan Rucci played seven snaps during the 2023 regular season with Wisconsin. Uh, seven total snaps. He's played in one Big Ten game in his career, three years at the college level. So Anthony Donka played almost 50 snaps uh, during the regular season last year. We saw Javon Williams play more than 30 snaps during the regular season last year. Jim Ono played almost 20 snaps. I mean, Jim Ono played 10 more snaps than Nolan Rucci did last year. And I know Rucci got some run. It kind of like mirrored each other a little bit. Uh, the left tackle goes down the Wisconsin game in their bowl matchup against LSU. Rucci has to step up. And then by design, Caden Wallace goes to the sideline against Ole Miss. And Anthony Donka shows up for the rest of the way. And these guys are both coming off really the most extended run of their college careers to this point. Rucci's eligibility is down to a couple years. And Donka has four years. And I'm just really interested to see how they build off of this, because I'd imagine there's going to be a transitional phase here 
where Rucci's getting acclimated to a new offensive line coach, a new offensive scheme. And they're all learning in some ways a new offensive scheme this year, obviously with Kotelnicki, but a lot more, I would say, a lot of more roots established for Anthony Donka in that offensive line room with the offensive line coach. So I think there's a very realistic uh, opportunity for Anthony Donka to be the primary right tackle as this team moves forward. And, and I don't think that question will be answered until August or later. And this is a spot that I'm particularly eyeing up for a potential rotation being in play next September. But man, this is a story with Anthony Donka that has shifted in a dramatic way, kind of at the, the 11th hour of their first year on campus. And it was, we assess the other portions of this offensive line class. Uh, we don't really have as many answers with a guy like Javen Williams. He played in three games, former five-star prospect, top lineman out of the state of Pennsylvania last year. And then Chim Diono, who's really a fascinating physical specimen out there on the football field. He, he, he was a late riser, a former Old Dominion commit, and, and Penn State ends up plucking him at the end of that cycle and bringing him on board. He gets to campus a little bit later, whereas Javen Williams is an early enrollee. I think either of these guys have the goods to push Drew Shelton. I don't know if they can beat Drew Shelton at left tackle here in 2024, but I think they can really kind of make sure he feels the presence uh, every day at the practice. And I'm curious whether Chim Diono, who we saw cross train on both sides, is he going to emerge on a particular side this year and kind of you know focus in on it on that, whether it's the right side or the left side, or is he a guy that's going to continue to cross train and Phil Troutline is going to continue to gauge because each of these guys in, in different ways, they do it differently. I think they 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 ascend it differently as prospects. I think they could be cornerstones for your offensive line. I don't know if that happens in 2024, maybe 2025 is more realistic. But really impressive stuff on the perimeter when you add Donka to Williams and to Ono. And because of what you had last year at tackle and the play you got and the health you got, and the backup that you had in Drew Shelton, you had the luxury of bringing these guys along at a very comfortable pace. I think, you know, Javon Williams and Shim Diono are two guys who have, you know, that kind of franchise tackle potential. I, I think a lot of that has to do with upside. I think a lot of that has to do with the athleticism. And I'll tell you one thing, man, based on the feedback we've received on Shim Diono, he definitely made up for lost time when he got on <laughs> and he His progression behind the scenes was really something to behold. Just, you know, the transformation in the weight room and just everything that went into another guy with a really high work ethic. That's a theme among this 2023 class on the offensive line. These guys are grinders. So those two really stand out. I mean, I, I'm interested to see, you know, moving forward, what side of the line they fall on. Cause I think both of those guys could play on either side and be perfectly fine. I feel like Ono is probably more of a left tackle long-term. I just feel like he has that skill set to him to be an elite blind side protector. I think Williams could do either side and be an elite guy, but it's, there's definitely a, uh, there's a lot for Phil Trowin to work with at that tackle position. He deserves some credit for what he put together in that 2023 class. Yeah, we did see Williams get a, a, some run at right tackle in our practice views. That was later in the season. Ono oh, was there predominantly during our practice looks, but they ultimately both got involved in different ways, kind of mixing and matching and, and trying to get a feel. And then kind of the, the mystery man, I think you could call him of this class because he was a, such a headliner of the recruiting class and he was an early commit. And he was no drama all the way, kind of like Cooper Cousins, a high level offensive lineman who committed early and just stayed the course in Alex Birchmeyer. Um, he did not enter any games last year. And, and as we noted during our practice reports at Lions 24 7 throughout the fall and, and through bowl, uh, bowl prep, he was a, a scout teamer. You know, this was a guy who we weren't anticipating to see in games on a week to week basis because he was wearing the, he wasn't wearing his own jersey and he was helping prepare the, the starting defense and the second team defense uh, for the upcoming matchup. And that continued all the way through Atlanta. Um, he started off his year at tackle. He finished off the year at guard where the concentration seems to be more on the interior now. Uh, and and so I, I wonder if it swings back, if they want to get a longer look at him at different positions in the spring or if Phil Tratwan is, is pretty settled in with Alex Birchmeyer. And, and, and look, not everybody gets results in year one. Offensive line is a hard one to, to squeeze out some gameplay from as a true freshman. They had some guys involved out there. No one burned their red shirt. But I think when people go a whole year without seeing a top 100 prospect, They've got questions. And so I would say this guy probably has the magnifying glass on him as much as anybody in this class does going into spring ball and kind of trying to figure out, does he factor into plans? Is he a real legit too deep component in 2024? And again, answers we probably won't have until August, 
But that path is already well underway here in 2024 for Birchmeyer and a lot of these young players. Yeah, I think whenever fans see a guy who was such a highly touted recruit like Birchmeyer get to campus and, you know, not see any game action and kind of be more behind the scenes, it raises some alarms, you know, whether or not that should be the case is up for interpretation. But uh, I think we'll know more about Birchmeyer coming out of this spring practice session. I, I think that we'll have a pretty, not, not a good idea, but a better idea of what his future holds. I mean, really, I always felt he translated more to the interior, seeing him in camps. I think he's got a guard skill set to him. You know, again, another guy in that 2023 class who has versatility to his game. So I think the picture will be a little bit clearer regarding Birchmeyer coming out of spring ball. But I haven't heard anything, you know, behind the scenes that should really be any cause for concern for right. his future. You laid it out perfectly, man. The fact of the matter is going from being a high school offensive lineman, no matter how talented you are, Going from being a high school offensive lineman and going up against Big Ten interior defensive linemen and Big Ten defensive ends on a daily basis, even when you're doing it just on the practice field, it's tough. It's not easy. For some guys, it takes a little bit longer to adjust. You know, that doesn't make them any lesser of a prospect and doesn't diminish their talent. But I think Birchmeyer, coming out of the spring, I think we'll probably have a clearer sense of where things are heading with him. And when I look at, at how this depth chart potentially shapes up and, and what they've been able to accrue at tackle and kind of just looking at, at Birchmeyer being slotted over at guard, if that's the route they do indeed go here in 2024, you know, that's an area where they do need some fortification. You've got Vega Ioane who, who could play left guard, right guard, center. He started the Peach Bowl. He started four games last year for you because J.B. Nelson, uh, you know, it was a competition, one, and then J.B. Nelson had, had issues staying healthy was the second part of that. So J.B. Nelson is back, a guy who's, who's played a lot of ball for you at this point, and you want to build off what he did in year one when he made nine starts. And then you got Sal Wormley back, who's going to be a third-year starter at the guard position. And so that's all great. There's the three guys you can win with. Uh, and, and, and and if Vega Ioane is not your starting center, then you've got three guards that can play two spots. But injuries happen, and 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 as we saw last year, and you got to have the next man up mentality. And uh, I'm looking around. This is where maybe the, you know where you got to figure Alex Birchmeyer, you know, could really take that step forward and fill a role. Maybe be a number two guard. Uh, I think you look around the room. Golden Israel Achumba is still on on this roster. He's a, he's a year five guy. Uh, he, he hasn't played in, in any me meaningful game snaps in his career. He played a, a six against UMass last season. That was the only action for him. He's been a scout team guy. He's been a great teammate. But now in year five, is, is he going to you know, be an answer for you at guard? I think you, you look at some of the younger players they're bringing in. You know, Donnie Harbour is, is a compelling prospect, but I don't think you count on a summer enrollee to the guard position to fortify your, your two deep. So to me, there's a real chance here that Alex Birchmeyer is, is kind of a sneaky, important factor in this offensive depth chart, Tyler, just because of, of maybe where the numbers are inside versus where they are on the perimeter right now. So it's, it's somebody that Troutwan told us this time last year, they felt like could play all five positions. Um, you know, we've seen him play a couple thus far and we'll find out where he lands and if he can really flourish there. Uh, former top 100 overall talent in Alex Birchmeyer. Um, elsewhere, you know, we spent all this time on the offensive front that we didn't learn a ton about this defensive line beyond Jameel Lyons. And look, Lyons could really be a breakout figure next year for this defense. You look at what he did, the way he flashed as a freshman, he burned red shirt, and he really was setting the world on fire on the practice field from week one in August. And this is a guy who was a summer enrollee. So Lyons is something to watch in the defensive line, but a lot to learn about three others. And, and the three others were all three star prospects in Ty Blanding. Uh, Joseph Mapoye and Mason Robinson. Robinson, Mapoye, defensive ends, Blanding on the interior. Blanding got in for one or two games as a freshman. Mapoye and Robinson did not see any game action. So, Tyler, again, Jameel Lyons could be a front end figure for this defensive line come next fall. The rest of this group, I, we got really very little sample size, whether it's on the practice field or otherwise to really build off of. I know that they've grown. I can confirm that their shoulders are, are wider and that they look a little bit leaner where they want, where they need to and they look bigger where they're supposed to. But in terms of football acumen and how they've grown in that department, we've still got questions and we'll have a chance to ask them soon. I want to note that we're expecting to meet with the uh, members of this class a little bit later on in the month uh, and, and we'll share that. But again, we got a lot of catching up to do with this group. Yeah, sample size wise, I think what you got from those guys is pretty much what was to be expected. You know, there right. was never a thought that these, you know, beyond Lions, who really, as like the summer approach, you start to hear a lot of positive buzz surrounding him. Then as fall camp went on, it was like, wow, this guy could help us right away. 
but the rest of the group, you know, the expectation was more a year or two out. So I think you can start to see some of these guys compete for, you know, spots on the two deep as soon as this offseason. I think that's a realistic possibility for some of them. I think Blanding has come along nicely in his development. Mupoye was always going to be one of those guys who needed a little bit more work, just given he was more of a higher ceiling guy who was newer to football coming out of St. Thomas more in that 2023 class. A lot of athletic upside there, though, so he's still developing. And then Mason Robinson, you know, the book on him is he's just always been solid all around. You know, he's a technician at defensive end, and he's continuing to come along as well. So I think you're going to see those three, you know, work their way into the conversation more moving forward. I think Robinson has got the potential to be a really solid defensive end for Penn State. Again, you know, when you just go back to his high school recruitment and the scouting report, not a whole lot of weaknesses from him, just really an all-around player. So I'm excited to see what his future holds, as the rest of this group as well. Um, and so look, I think when we work our way through this and, and you're right, the, the timetables are different position by position and, and the closer you are to the football, uh, that's being snapped, the tougher it is to get out there. We hear that often, um, the, the, the components that go into the trenches as that transition, you factor in the tight ends to that a little bit too. We're going to get to them, but you're right. No one's behind schedule here because they weren't necessarily involved. Defensive end was supremely deep last year. It's going to be a little less deep, and now you look at you know who's going to step up and start to fill some of the you know, third team jobs and all that stuff. And and defensive tackle though, Ty Blanding's got his work cut out for him. This is, they didn't lose a single scholarship component. They're going to bring back Alonzo Ford, who, who missed last season after his transfer from Old Dominion. So uh, it, it is a group that doesn't give a lot of room, uh, you know, for, for for young players to to barge their way uh, into game action. So a lot to learn about them. And at tight end, as I said. It is such a transition. We hear it every single year. Some of these guys go from being high school receivers, essentially, to being asked to block the, the Deez Isaacs and Chop Robinsons of the world on a practice field. And Joey Schlafer, I think that was particularly a, a really, you know, a challenging part of his transition. A guy who's 220 pound range coming to campus, uh, did a lot of good things as a receiving tight end at the high school level. But the name here, Tyler, when you look at this tight end, you got the two red shirts in Schlafer and Rappelier. Rappelier is hard to ignore. And Daniel and I discussed him when we were breaking down our offensive depth chart conversation last episode. And we'll pick that up with the defensive depth chart conversation next week, Daniel and I. But it's hard to ignore his pr potential presence when you lose Theo Johnson. Khalil Dinkins is back. Tyler Warren is back. Luke Reynolds is all of a sudden on campus as a former five-star but he's only about 225 pounds. So he's got a lot of ground to make up in that regard. Whereas Rappelier is a guy who has a full fall under his belt of action. And I think three games under his belt as well. And just somebody that you wondered all year, if they needed to turn to him because of an injury, which fortunately they didn't, would he have been ready to perform? And I feel like he probably would have uh, in a lot of different ways for a freshman tight end in the big 10. I think he would have been ready to perform. I think there are a lot of people inside of Lash who think he would have been ready to perform if he was thrust into that kind of action. There's a lot of excitement about where his career is headed and where his potential could take him. You know, even with Tyler Warren back in 2024, I think you're going to see a lot of Andrew Rappley. I think he's going to be a big factor in that tight end room. And that kind of goes back to the traits that we saw out of him during his high school recruitment when he was a star at Milton Academy in Massachusetts. The athleticism, the pass catching ability, he's come along as a blocker. I remember when we were on campus in June for a 7 on 7 tour, and we saw Andrew Rappelio standing around, and you could just see the physical transformation and how much he improved his body, which was already in good shape coming from his high school career. He put in a lot of work with Chuck Losey during the offseason, and he got himself in really good shape. And he's just – he's been on an upward trajectory since he arrived on campus. I think that's going to continue in 2024, and I think he's going to be right there alongside Tyler Warren contributing as part of that tight end depth chart. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm really, uh, really excited to see how his per career progresses. And he came in when he was on this podcast right before his enrollment, did not shy away, said he wanted to add his name to the list of great Penn State tight ends and knew the competition was going to get tougher. He didn't know that the number one tight end in the country was going to be following him to campus and Luke Reynolds, but he knew that Penn State was always going to be looking for the next big thing at that position. Another guy to get to, I, I, we called uh, Alex Birchmeyer the mystery man, and, and that I still think is accurate, but you could probably make a case for Carmelo Taylor to Tyler Calvaruso. He, he was a big riser in 24-7 sports rankings, a guy that jumped up into the top 24-7. Uh, but he was, prior to his senior season uh, down in Roanoke, Virginia, a big-time track guy. The track numbers were sensational. State championship sprinter. Uh, not a lot of size to work off at that point. You could kind of project what he might be as a football player. He answered a lot of questions as a receiver during his high school senior season, but 
one, he was brought in by a wide receivers coach who's no longer here in Taylor Stubblefield. Uh, and two, he was the only freshman receiver brought to campus on scholarship last year in a receiver room that badly needed some answers and productivity. So you got to I mean, it's it's all or nothing here for the 2023 class at receiver with Carmelo Taylor, who, quite frankly, just has not really established a major track record as a football player just yet. Yeah, 2023 was always going to be a development year for Taylor. I think he definitely made some strides working behind the scenes, but he's still coming in, into his own as a receiver, still coming in, into his own as a pass catcher, still coming into his own as a route runner. You know, he definitely improved in those areas late in his high school career. But again, we're talking about a track guy who's, you know, still kind of becoming a football player and still becoming a receiver. So he's he's definitely made some positive strides, still probably a ways to go. But uh, I think Penn State has been encouraged by his development because he's got speed, you know, you just can't teach at the wide receiver position. He's added some good weight in the upper body, so he's stronger than he was when he got to campus. So things are looking good here. You know, maybe it's a little bit longer before we see him making an impact in that receiver room. But again, that kind of speed, it tends to work its way into the equation sooner rather than later, as long as everything else comes along and follows behind it. Yeah, the, the speed is elite. You know, they could use a dose of that, and 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 we'll find out with Carmelo Taylor this spring. He's a guy that we got to see on the scout team a little bit. Um, just hard to pick up much uh, when 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 you're working through a receiver group that has, I think, twelve guys on scholarship right now, and just so many of them have a lot to prove. And he certainly kind of leads the list, being the new guy around um, at defensive back. We saw King Mac. Zion Tracy, Elliott Washington burned their red shirts. Uh, defensive backfield was as involved as any when in terms of that 2023 class last year. And third cornerback, Lamont Payne, you know, somebody who was considered maybe a versatile component of this class, someone who could be a safety long term or be a cornerback. We've seen them bring guys to campus at cornerback and eventually transition them to safety after a year or two. Keaton Ellis, Zaki Wheatley, and the other was a safety all the way. Dakari Nelson, a four-star, top 24-7 prospect, the guy that we wondered if his physical growth and maturation might lead him to a linebacker role. And we were told pretty emphatically last year when he was coming to campus that was not the case. Um, we didn't see a ton of, of, of either of these guys. They got checked in for a couple games along the way, preserved their red shirt. Saw a lot of them out there for the scout team. And I'll tell you what, both of these guys, the length stands out. Lamont Payne's got as much length as anybody in that cornerback room right now, I think, in just terms of his wingspan and, and the way he kind of stands out a little bit running through drills. And the Cardi Nelson, you could easily confuse him uh, for an outside linebacker there when we're just watching him roam as we thought we might. Um, what, what do you remember about these two coming to campus and carrying forward? What are you most curious about as they develop? I remember when I first got eyes on Lamont Payne at that whiteout camp in 2023, I wasn't quite sure what he was going to be at the next level in terms of cornerback or safety. I still think at the end of it all, he's probably training towards, he, I definitely think he could wind up at safety. But I'd say Payne, I don't want to call him one of the surprises of the class, but he has been kind of a pleasant surprise in the secondary. You know, there's been a lot of praise for him behind the scenes. Again, you know, whether it's at corner or safety, what his future holds, I'm not quite sure yet. But I think he's going to be a factor as an upperclassman. You know, when you hear him pop up in conversation as a guy who has accomplished a lot behind the scenes, that's always encouraging. I really don't know exactly what the car Nelson is going to be at this point. I think he's going to be a big time player for Penn State, just given the upside. I mean, going back to his recruitment, I remember him multiple times on here, me saying he was one of my favorite players in mm -hmm. this class. And I mean, whether he, I think he's probably going to grow into that Sam linebacker role. But even if he sticks at safety as a bigger safety, I think he's going to be a player for Penn State as his career progresses. Again, whether he's down you know, close to the line of scrimmage, making tackles or making plays over the top, Cardinal's going to do a lot of different things. I think he's going to grow into that Sam role. I think that's kind of the likely outcome for him, which, you know, if that's what happens, I think Penn State has another versatile piece at Sam. I think that's another really good option for Tom Allen to work with. But Carl Nelson's going to be a guy. All the positive feedback from him that has rolled in throughout the months doesn't come as any sort of surprise for me. I would say something that really I think stands out with Nelson is you know he is six foot three, two hundred and twenty pounds already. But wherever you want him to be, I think you just got to really try to find him a home. And, yeah. and I, I think that the trickiest part is like, well, let's see. They, you know, we saw Mark uh, Marquise Wilson a few years back. This predates your time on campus, I think. But they were kind of, is he a cornerback? Is he wide receiver? He spent time in, in both rooms and ultimately it kind of took him away from the field. He wasn't really either for them on game days a lot of weeks. And then with Tyrese Mills, someone they brought in from the junior college level, 
We've seen him kind of, you know, kind of work his way back and forth between linebacker, the same position and safety. And as he kind of really found a home to this point. So with Dakari Nelson, I mean, th that Sam role is really interesting right now because you lost Curtis Jacobs. He spent a couple of years starting at that spot for you. Uh, and, and now you've got uh, Don DeLuca, who had a really good season as your as your primary backup there. And it was a special team stalwart for you. But, you know, how does he look in the starting role? you got Tony Rojas to consider, somebody who, you know, could really potentially contribute at, at any of these linebacker spots, but he's ready to break through. Uh, another body wouldn't be the worst thing there. Maybe Tyrese Mills is that name. But maybe Dakari Nelson comes on, and maybe this is 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 just all terrible to hear if you're Dakari Nelson because you think you're a safety all the way, and maybe that's what the staff has their sights set on. But I just look at potentially breaking through at safety. That's not an easy task right now, too. Uh, can you step up and try to be the fourth safety right now? I think King Mack, I'm, I'm going to probably lean him because he got some experience on the field. He did burn his red shirt. Um, and, and I think he's just you know, a little bit more of a natural playmaker when he got to a college campus based on what we heard in year one. But the Curry Nelson, formidable presence, but where is the path to playing time in 2024? We've got two safeties locked in as starters, a key Wheatley behind them. And then even at linebacker, if we're looking there, uh, that, that's a that's a talented room, but this is a very talented player. Top 200 overall talent coming out of the state of Alabama. He was a wrecking ball down there on high school field. So uh, a, a name to look at a, a bit a bit further here on the defensive backfield. But where do you break through? That is kind of a question for some of these guys. At linebacker, mentioned Rojas burning red shirt. Kavion Keys, Tamir Robinson, four star talents, uh, top 24 seven for Keys. He was a guy who spent a lot of time committed to North Carolina before making a switch over to Penn State's class. And Keyes was a guy who really came on strong as, as the year progressed. You know, we heard a lot of good things about Tamir Robinson knocking off the rust. He didn't play a lot as a high school upperclassman because of injuries, looking really settled in as a box linebacker, maybe being a vocal kind of presence if need be uh, at, at Mike down the road for him. But Kavion Keys, by the end of the season, he's the name that kept popping up uh, to me, Tyler Calvaruso, and he got it done as a special teamers and as a defender on the scout team. He was the scout team player of the year for both of those units. And now I want to know what the, what year two looks like, because as I said, a linebacker, you don't lose much. Abdul Carter's there. Kobe King's there. You know, Kavion Keys has, has been operating largely uh, all over the place at, at, at linebacker, as far as we could tell. Um, so I really want to know, does Penn State kind of tailor this season towards finding a role for him on the two deep? Do they stay the course if it means he's going to be a third guy at a position? Because it just sounded like he was scratching the surface and really ready to break through, but there wasn't quite a need for him on the field last fall. Yeah, his best football is definitely still ahead of him. His ceiling is extremely high. The Penn State staff has always been pretty bullish on his potential. You saw some of that, you know, come through and shine through during his true freshman season. And I think um, I think he's got a chance to work his way into that too deep conversation in 2024. But again, they're not going to rush him on in the field, give him what it what they return at linebacker. Like you said, they did not lose a whole lot there. So, you know, they could afford to be patient with keys and really find him a true home if that's the route that they choose to take. But I think he can definitely work his way into that too deep conversation. Tamir Robinson's probably behind him, but don't sleep on Tamir Robinson either. You know, he made some strides as well. He was kind of working his way back into, you know, game action. Like you said, he didn't see a whole lot of time on the field due to injuries and upperclassmen in high school, but He's another guy Penn State has always been pretty excited about. And his, you know, transition to full-time linebacker has been a good one. But Keys, I mean, Curtis Jacobs was praising him at the end of the year. Just And behind the scenes, the praise has been even higher. He's the guy that Penn State feels can be a real difference maker in his de in its defense as his career progresses. You know, can't go wrong with him and guys like Tony Rojas on board. I think at the very least, Keys could really become a, a – key component of special teams coverage, yeah. uh, you know, maybe starting off next season and then work off of that. And with Tamir Robinson, one thing I'll add, and this goes back to, to you know, maybe midway through preseason camp, a little bit later in preseason camp, something we were hearing regarding feedback with Robinson is, is someone who seems like he could be, uh, you know, someone good at dictating on the field to his teammates. And, and when you look at kind of personality traits that work at the Mike linebacker position, uh, that's a really important piece is being able to disseminate the information from the sideline 
to the field in a very short window of time. And it sounds like he was able to make some strides in that department over the course of his first year on campus and really honing in at the linebacker spot. Let's go over to running back and, and then we'll finish with quarterback where, where there's not as, quite as much drama when the, the depth chart conversation. And Daniel and I spent some time discussing these running backs and, and their potential role in the depth chart last episode with Cam Wallace and, and London Montgomery. Both of them were three-star prospects coming to campus. They were followed by a, a top 200 overall recruit in Quentin Martin now, who's going to be – his mission will be to leapfrog both of them and enter game conversations. We've got Nick Singleton and Catron Allen leading the pack, but Trey Potts deciding to go pro opens the door here for someone to be that third running back. Maybe get involved uh, with Nick Singleton as, as a kick returner as well. And so I think there is a lot of – I hate to use the word pressure for a year two guy – but it's hard not to sense it in this running back room because of who they bring in on a perennial basis and how J1 Slater, you know, commands competition on a day-to-day -day basis in this room. So I think there is maybe a sense of, of, of maybe a, the fire being lit underneath these guys going into spring ball because Quentin Martin's here. They've got a two running back class following behind in 2025 and opportunities will be limited behind Nick Singleton and Katron Allen. So for both Wallace M. Montgomery, who, who bounced back off of a, a torn ACL his senior year of high school, I think this is a huge year, not just for what your present looks like at Penn State as a retro freshman, but what your career trajectory and, and what you may be able to develop into can become. Because if you get log jammed or bogged down this step chart coming out of the year, it could be tough to work your way back up. I do think there is pressure. And it, that kind of just speaks more to who Quentin Martin and Corey Smith is. Mm -hmm. as players than it does Cam Wallace and Linda Montgomery because both those guys can play in their own right. And, I mean, even beyond, you know, the guys who are arriving on campus as true freshmen, you've got two grid backs in that 2025 class. And then even further out is Messiah Mickens, who is going to be an elite <laughs> back when he gets right. to college. Thank you. So, yeah. You know, those guys, it's all it's all part of this process. I think with Cam Wallace – him and Andy Kotelnicki's system is really intriguing to me. We always talk about how Kotelnicki gets, you know, his playmakers the ball in space, lets them do their thing in the open field. Wallace is always profiled as a guy as kind of who fits that profile to a T. You get him the ball in open space and you let him do his thing because he's shifty. He's good at making defenders miss. Physically, he came along as a true freshman. I mean, there were points during the offseason where it seemed like Wallace was going to have an opportunity to seriously challenge for playing time. Tyler, yeah. Tyler, he is the freshman I'm surprised we didn't see. If you said yeah. it, it wouldn't be Alex Birchmeyer for me because of the way the offensive line works. If you said who's the freshman who didn't play and, and that stunned you, Cam Wallace. I'm I'm shocked that there wasn't a spot for him on the field at some point during a blowout even. Um, I, I just thought we would get a glimpse of him and everyone would kind of go into this offseason saying at least there's something in the back of their head because they had seen an image of it. Instead, you, know, you haven't seen him do it on the football field now and it's even more of an intriguing kind of – I thought maybe they were keeping him under the radar before they got the Big Ten play, to be honest with you. And it just turned out that was the game plan. And and, and just to build off of that, Sider had never registered uh, a freshman at, at the running back position at Penn State. And he actually told me, because well, I asked him about it, he told me he has never registered a freshman as a running back's coach at the Division One level. And this was the first time he had done it, and he did it twofold with two of these guys. So I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to jump on that. No, but good. I was surprised. And this was an extremely unique situation in J1 Slater's career, where we have to say Singleton and Allen are there, but this was an offense that felt game the game could use some an infusion, a playmaker, right? It just it needed a spark, and uh, for one reason or another, you know, neither of these running backs were deemed valuable enough or, or, or prepared enough or whatever you want to phrase it. They were not game planable uh, it, it, during their freshman seasons. They were typically in the scout team jerseys wearing the the opponents' numbers. It caught me by surprise, too, specifically with Wallace, just given how often he was coming up in preseason conversations. You know, whenever you get that preseason buzz, more times than not, those guys wind up being real factors, or at least some degree, as true freshmen. It didn't happen with Cam Wallace for one reason or another. You know, we'll see where things go with him as a redshirt freshman. Montgomery, you know, coming off his knee injury, I wasn't expecting a whole lot of him in 2023. You know, we wound up seeing that that was what wound up playing out. You know, he was he definitely made strides behind the scenes. And the big thing with him was he's getting his knee back to full strength. You know, Penn State was never going to rush him into the equation given the injury that he was coming off of and the severity of that injury. But I think he's back to being the London Montgomery who rushed for 2,000 yards at Scranton Prep, and that could be potentially big for Penn State's running back room moving forward. But 
you know, it's a, it's a pressure cooker. It's big time college football. So these guys are going to have to show something. Montgomery was back on the field going through full practice uh, at the power five level less than a year after suffering yeah. that knee injury in high school. So I think that was great to see. And then he was at every practice we saw, as far as I can remember, this isn't a guy who had to step aside and, and deal with anything, you know, kind of the ramifications of that. I'm sure there's, there's some ways they've been managing his, 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 his work, working back from that, but kudos to him because behind the scenes uh, that, that was probably not easy to deal with. And, and so you get through the end of the, uh, of the of the season and of, the, of that year, and you don't know much about Cam Wallace and Lada Montgomery, but you know that they are uh, competitive enough to want to be part of this running back room, and, and they're bought into it by all indications. So the other guy we got to talk about uh, in that backfield, and we'll finish up the redshirt conversation, we don't expect to see much of him this year. As Daniel and I alluded to, if we do see much of him in 2024, things have kind of gotten off track probably offensively. Yeah. But Jackson Smolik, um, I remember he came to camp and, and you were covering him closely that day. And uh, Mike Yersich was following him closely. He got his offer and pretty quickly he ends up being part of Penn State's 2023 class. Previously pledged to Tulane, got a late opportunity to compete in the Elite 11 finals, balled out out there, became a finalist at that event. And a lot of Power 5 interest was starting to brew when he was, all right, I'm in with Penn State, comfortable with it. He got to campus last January. Not a lot of fanfare for a quarterback recruit, uh, Tyler, but behind the scenes, I really liked what we heard about him. Professional approach, someone who was prepared on the practice field to challenge the defense. Uh, I think he probably took more hits than he dished out on the practice field against this Penn State defensive unit. But he gets through the process, gets involved for one or two snaps because there's a situation where Bo Prabula needs some medical treatment briefly when he's in a backup situation in a blowout. But Smoke takes the rest of his work on the practice field. What do you make of him as a quarterback prospect? And based on maybe what you've heard about him since coming to Penn State, do we need to be paying more attention to him as a viable option to 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 maybe impress Andy Kotelnicki, to, to work his way into this depth chart? It just seems so obvious that it's Drew Aller, Bo Prabula, and then there's this gap, and it's going to be Jackson Smolik trying to stiff arm Ethan Grunkemeyer and hold on to that third job and really set himself up for what could be a very interesting 2025 offseason at the quarterback spot. Yeah, you know, I think he definitely has the tools to impress Andy Kotelnicki, and, but Grunkemeyer is just so talented. It's going to be a fight to hang on to that third spot. But again, that's another situation where it's probably more about the guy coming in than it is the guy currently on campus. Grunkemeyer is just – I think he's got a really bright future ahead of him. But Smolik has all the tools to impress Andy Kotelnicki and continue progressing and, you know, just keep moving forward in his development. I think the big thing is – and, you know, you mentioned it. If Jackson Smolik is, you know, playing significant snaps for Penn State in 2024 – something happened, you know, I mean, that's just the facts of it. But I think if he was put into that situation, he has come along to the point where, you know, he wouldn't be like a deer in the headlights out there or anything like that. He'd be able to go out there and make throws and run Penn State's offense at a level that it could still, you know, move the change and put points on the board. I think that's an encouraging little bit that has come from his development behind the scenes. Look, Penn State went out and got Jackson Smolik in this 2023 class, you know, with the hopes of him being their guy at quarterback one day. And, you know, the notion is he's definitely shown enough arm talent wise and just in his progression overall to still be in that conversation moving forward. And, and I'll just say the descriptors about him as a freshman did kind of paint a picture that that he's somebody who you know, you'd have to maybe change the game plan if he's in a quarterback. Yeah. But the sky wouldn't have been falling if he went out a quarterback like we've seen in the past. Sometimes when Penn State's had to turn to younger quarterbacks who hadn't really experienced extended game action but you don't quite know though as much as we can hear that uh, until jackson small gets his opportunity and it's going to be a tough opportunity to claim here at penn state at quarterback and, and he understood that coming to campus following up a two quarterback class with drew aller and bo perbula and fully understanding that penn state was going to try to find somebody behind him as well tyler there is the the redshirt freshman class we we just went through a bunch of them if you had to kind of pick one name and i think it's going to be more of an educated guess here than a than a throw at the dartboard but out of all the guys we just covered, who do you think this time next year is maybe more of an established, doesn't even have to be a starter, but really an established presence within the Penn State football conversation, and they really will have proven themselves out on the football field by then? The easy answer is Anthony Donka. I do think he has the potential to win the starting job on this Penn State offensive line in 2024. You know, there are a couple other guys I'm really interested to see where things go. King Mac, I mean, I know that, you know, 
he's just I think that he could be a factor in that secondary in 2024. I think gotta Bowl, watch him in the slot. I mean, yeah, they that's what I think. so much in the slot. We didn't really get to see that piece of it with uh, with King Mac this year, but going back to preseason camp, everyone would be like, and also he's going to be a very good slot corner. Like everyone would say he's gonna be great in slot coverage. We love him at safety, he can play a slot. So it, just keep an eye on that, folks. Yeah, that definitely needs to be. You know, where does he fit into the plans? Because he's a talented guy that Penn State's gonna have a tough time keeping off the field. But for me, I feel like Donka just coming out of this 2024 season, I think we're gonna be talking about him as one of Penn State's, you know, not only established, I think he's got a chance to be one of Penn State's better players. You know, I know I know that's you know a lot to say given he's so early in his career still. We're talking about a guy who's gonna be a redshirt freshman. But he has just showed so much, and he has been so productive and has done so much good work behind the scenes. It's kind of tough to ignore where he's at right now. You, But if I asked you that on Christmas, I don't think you would have said Anthony no. Donka. It's amazing how, you know, a, a, an opportunity and, and what you do with it can really kind of change the complexion. It. Yeah, and I, I, I'm just going to go, I think, Tony Rojas. Yeah. Uh, I love Dom DeLuca and, and what he is, and I'm not going to cast him aside and, and say that he can't be a starter for this for this defense moving forward. I just think Tony Rojas is going to be tough to fend off. And I think generally speaking, even if he's not a starter for this defense, the amount of reps that I think they're going to be forced to give Tony Rojas because of how good he's going to look on the practice field and how much he's going to maybe mean to the heartbeat of this defense. I got a pretty good – I got a better sense, I should say, for Tony Rojas – in the aftermath of the Peach Bowl, spent a few minutes talking to him. There's a fire to this guy. And I, and I think we, I had heard it from a lot of people, but you can hear, like, just talking about taking ownership, a little bit more ownership of the defense, a little bit more ownership of the linebacker room in 2024 as a sophomore. Man, I, I, and I know I'm talking about a red shirt. For, and I'm not talking about a red shirt here. He's the guy that I think from the whole class stands out. But then KV on keys at linebacker. I just think he's going to find a way from this redshirt freshman class next year to, to prove to be some kind of a, a linchpin. It might be a special teams guy. It might be a, a rotational component on, on the, at, the, at the linebacker. But I think those two guys really stand out to me. Uh, Rojas, I'm obviously cheating because he's not a red shirt, but I'm going to yeah, linebacker I think too, so. with those two. And I think Tamir Robinson, maybe it's a different path for him, but I think he's coming. He's going to come along as well in his own right. But I think it's going to be hard to keep keys off the field just like it'll be hard to keep Rojas off the field for Tom Allen and the, and the defensive staff and ultimately James Franklin. So Tyler, appreciate the lowdown. We spent a long time here talking about the future and and and, the, and also the, a little bit looking in the rearview mirror at this 2023 class that we still have a long way to go with learning them. Uh, anything coming uh, our folks way at 24 seven sports lines, 24 seven, we should be aware of between now and, 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 you know, early next week, I guess it's gonna be a whole lot of uh, junior day coverage. Yep, it's going to be a busy weekend. A lot of feedback coming in, just like the last two weekends. So definitely stay tuned for that because there's a lot in store. All right, we'll be back with a couple more episodes next week. We'll certainly recap what goes down in Happy Valley this upcoming Saturday. Tyler, appreciate the perspective. On behalf of him, I'm Tyler Donahue. Stepping aside for now, this has been the Lions 24-7 Podcast.